Thank you very much for having me. My name is Kezia Scales. I'm the Vice President of Research and Evaluation for PHI. Um, and I'm happy to be with you this afternoon to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the long-term care workforce. So just really briefly to introduce my organization, PHI is a national nonprofit organization that's dedicated to promoting quality direct care jobs as the foundation of quality care for older adults and people with disabilities across long-term care settings. We address the quality of direct care jobs through a range of interventions from workforce development efforts on the ground with employers to research, policy advocacy, and public education efforts designed to enact systems level and structural change. And everything that we do at PHI is motivated by the belief here on this slide that caring, committed relationships between direct care workers and their clients are at the heart of quality care. And those relationships work best when direct care workers receive high quality training, when they earn living and competitive wages, and when they're respected for the central role they play on the interdisciplinary care team. I have no disclosures to report. Uh, so these are my um, hoped for learning objectives for this session, that by the end of the session, attendees will be able to first of all describe key characteristics of the direct care workforce that provides long-term services and supports, or LTSS in California, including, most importantly, direct support in, this, in the context of this conversation, direct support professionals, or DSPs. The second learning objective is that attendees will be able to name at least three impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on this frontline workforce and on service provision. And finally, the attendees will be able to discuss policy and practice opportunities for strengthening this workforce to support people living with developmental disabilities and complex healthcare needs. So I'll begin by providing a data-driven snapshot of the direct care workforce, which as I'll explain, includes the DSPs, the direct support professionals that this audience is most likely to encounter and work with. So when I say direct care workers, I'm talking about the nearly 812,000 paid frontline caregivers in California who support older adults and people with disabilities with essential daily tasks and activities in private homes, community settings, residential care settings, nursing homes, and other settings. The vast majority of direct care workers are the home health aides and personal care aides who are employed primarily in home and community-based services and settings. And this is where direct support professionals or DSPs who support individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities are most likely to be counted. The side note here, of course, is that DSPs don't have their own occupational code through the Bureau of Labor Statistics at this point. And so we're not able to separately quantify and describe that segment of the workforce, uh, which is a real limitation in our field. Uh, but they are definitely here in the numbers that I'm presenting. The direct care workforce in California, like everywhere, is predominantly female. And the majority of these workers are people of color. Also, nearly half of the workforce of the direct care workforce in California um, are immigrants, people who are born outside the United States. And it's always important to highlight these demographic characteristics because they matter when we think about how these jobs are structured and valued in our society and within our systems. And also when we think about how to retain existing workers and recruit new job candidates to the field, which, is, which are two critical needs in the context of current workforce gaps. To focus in on DSPs specifically, this graphic is from a 2022 report called Community Supports in Crisis, No Staff, No Services, which is sort of an overlay to my full talk today. Um, it, that really captures the tone of the moment. Um, and this graphic shows how nationally just over 60% of DSPs work in private homes, either in their own homes or their clients' homes. About a third work in group housing of two up to about 15 people. And about 4% are employed in more institutional settings. 
And here's a quote directly from a direct support professional um, about their role. This is uh, somebody called Kao Sefan, who was employed um, at, at the time of this interview by Homebridge, which is an organization that provides home care and supportive services to clients in the Bay Area through California's in-home supportive services or IH, IHSS system. And here is how Cow describes his role. He says, each client has their own unique personality and characteristics that make them so special. I provide personal care, emotional support, domestic work, even run errands. I'm there for my clients if they need or want anything, offer an extra hand to help or an extra ear to listen and let them know they are not alone and that there is somebody out there who cares about them. I think this is a really important quote because in this one quote, you can see the range of skills that Cal brings to the job, the technical skills and the interpersonal skills, the emotional labor, as well as the physical labor that's required, the support that he offers for independence and community engagement. Uh, so really good to hear from workers themselves about how they see this work. Uh, I just want to note that Cal was a participant in PHI's Direct Care Worker Story Project, which is a project that aims to elevate the voices and experiences of direct care workers across settings and across the country. And you can find these stories uh, on our website, which is phinational.org. And I'll share that again at the end. So considering the broad audience here today, I just want to take a moment now to, to really explicate in broad strokes how the role and contributions of someone like Cow, uh, quoted on the previous slide, interface with healthcare services and providers in the context of care for those with complex conditions. Um, so here I'll use the language of DSPs specifically rather than the more broad direct care workforce terms. Um, so this is a bit of a laundry list and it's not exhaustive either, but first of all, in their day-to-day -day role, DSPs help promote health and well-being to the degree possible through the provision of personal care, by supporting nutrition, by encouraging maintenance of functional abilities, combating social isolation, and more and thereby helping to prevent or delay adverse health outcomes and greater health utilization. So that's a sort of preventive element of the role. Relatedly, but more specifically, they are often in a really strong position to help identify social determinants of health that no other member of the care team may be aware of, like unsafe living conditions or food scarcity, for example. They are in a position to be able to see those negative social determinants of health and flag them um, and, and try to, in, in some cases, be able to help mitigate them as well. For example, by helping to connect individuals with supportive, with other supportive services. DSPs often play a direct and practical role in helping individuals schedule and keep their healthcare appointments. Um, so they provide that bridge between the individual's home and the clinic or hospital or other care setting. And as with social determinants of health, they may be more likely than anybody else on the care team, aside from family members, to be able to see when there's a change of status or condition that may need intervention. They may be able to see that somebody seems a little bit off from their baseline, that something seems to be uh, different with how they're doing or feeling or acting. And if they are able to observe those changes and have the communication channels in place to share them with other members of the team, then they may be able to alert clinical partners to to um, take those interventions earlier than they might have otherwise. In many cases, depending on their role and regulations, DSPs also provide health-related support, anything from medication reminders to monitoring vital signs or undertaking key activities related to managing diabetes or other chronic health conditions. And then finally, related to all of this, DSPs can play a really important role in communicating information to and from the individual and family members and other health and social care providers. Again, when those communication structures and also interpersonal competencies are in place. And it's not that 
that every DSP is accomplishing every one of these tasks in every case, but this is the range of um, opportunities that we see, and, and in many cases, a combination are at play, and the potential is there for fulfilling of all of these roles. So now to take a, a step back again to look at the bigger workforce picture overall. The direct care workforce is essential. That was that was really recognized during the COVID-19 pandemic once and for all, but it is a persistently undervalued and underfunded workforce. So low wages and high poverty for direct care workers are the norm. As you can see here on the slide, California's direct care workers, the full direct care workforce, earn a median wage of just 1470 an hour and their median personal earnings are just under $21,000 a year. As a result, nearly half of this workforce relies on public assistance like Medi-Cal or CalFresh, for example, and 37%, so more than a third, live in or near poverty, meaning below 200% of the federal poverty level. And unfortunately, as you can see on the other side of the slide, these numbers reflect reality for direct care workers across the United States. And wages are not the only challenge for this workforce. Um, so in general, benefits, employment related benefits are limited uh, for direct care workers. So less than half of the direct care workforce in California has health insurance through an employer or union, for example, and that may not be their own employer or union even. While 40, 41% of direct care workers in California rely on Medicaid or another public payer, and 10%, one in 10 are in, uninsured entirely. Uh, retirement savings plans are very limited for direct care workers. National studies estimate that 85% of direct care workers have no retirement benefits. And there is limited access to paid leave benefits across the country for this workforce. Um, although the situation is better in California than in many states because of existing and more newly enacted uh, paid leave laws. This workforce is also disproportionately at risk of occupational exposures and injuries across settings of care including with, with respect to the risk of violence, as well as physical and emotional impacts of the work. And recent research, including research conducted by PHI, shows that direct care workers overall and home care workers in particular, so the segment of this workforce that's working in home and community-based settings, have poorer health status and access to health care than other healthcare occupations. These jobs are also characterized for the most part by limited training opportunities, few recognized career pathway opportunities, and in many cases, inadequate support and supervision in navigating the challenges of this work and providing optimal care. And all of these challenges together contribute to significant instability and turnover in this workforce. So this last bullet is about DSPs in particular. It's from uh, the results of a national survey of, DS of uh, IDD service providers. Um, this is a national core indicators IDD state of the workforce survey that was actually just released. Um, and this survey shows that 43%, the, the average turnover ratio among DSPs uh, was 43% in 2021, and three quarters of that turnover was voluntary turnover. And job vacancy ranged from 17% for full-time workers to 20% for part-time workers. This instability, of course, compromises all of those key functions and contributions that I, that I talked through on the previous slide. And yet, even as we're struggling to fill open positions and stabilize this essential workforce, the direct care workforce will continue to need to add absolutely more workers to meet growing demand over time. So what this slide shows is that in California, the direct care workforce is expected to add nearly 233,000 new jobs in the next decade from 2020 to 2030, and that's more new jobs, as you can see, than the next 
two occupations with the most expected job growth combined. In within this direct care workers category, the most new jobs by far will be for personal care aides, which is the majority of DSPs as compared to nursing assistants and home health aides. And what's more, job growth is not the only, um, is, is it really only part of the picture? Because when you also take into account job separations as well as new jobs, so when people leave their occupations or leave this, leave the labor force altogether, um, there will be over 1.4 million total job openings in California in direct care that will need to be filled from 2020 to 2030. Again, more total jobs that will need to be filled than any other occupation in the state. Filling these jobs and making sure that individuals living with disabilities and complex health conditions can access the services and supports they need over time is quite a daunting prospect. Now I said all of that before actually getting to the impact of COVID-19 because the pandemic had a disproportionate and brutal impact on those who receive and provide long-term services and supports, but in large part by exacerbating risks and challenges that were already there long before the pandemic. So a lot of what I said already is sort of like, it, it, it's the norm that only became worse in the last few years. But COVID-19 did absolutely exacerbate workforce challenges, and it did so across all healthcare settings, as we know all too well. This slide is just one particular illustration of, of that impact. This is from this graphic here is from the Peterson Center on Healthcare and Kaiser Family Foundation, and it shows how far current employment across various healthcare settings falls short of where we would expect it to be if it had not been for the pandemic. These data are from December 2022. And what we can see is that employment has climbed back up over across settings, but it's still lower across the board than it would have been if it hadn't been for COVID-19. And far lower, far relatively lower, far lower really, in post-acute and long-term care settings, including, as you can see here, home health services, nursing care facilities, and quote, community care facilities for the elderly. This figure does not capture the full staffing picture in home and community-based settings by any means, but it's still one way of visualizing the workforce pressures across our health and long-term care system. So to draw out a little bit more some of the specific impacts on DSPs and other direct care workers, first of all, as I've already spoken to, long-standing job quality challenges, recruitment and retention challenges were amplified during COVID-19, given the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on long-term services and supports and on communities of color. So in other words, direct care workers were doubly at risk given where they work, the services they were providing, and because many of them, the majority of them come from higher risk communities themselves. We also saw that many, many direct care workers had to reduce their hours and or lost wages for a range of reasons during the pandemic, including due to family caregiving responsibilities as schools and daycares and other services were closed down, uh, when they had to quarantine because of exposure or actual infection, out of deep, deep fear, um, particularly in the earlier waves of the pandemic around catching the virus or spreading it. So being the vector um, of, the, of the virus between their own homes and families and their clients' homes uh, or other care settings. Um, in many cases, um, a partner, you know, somebody else in the household losing their, their job and losing that income. So these workers were in incredibly financially precarious time during the pandemic. And again, especially earlier in the pandemic, these workers were really at the bottom of the chain when it came to distributing PPE 
providing COVID specific updates, information, training, putting safety protocols, tailored safety protocols in place and so on. These were all challenges across the healthcare system again, but magnified and more slowly resolved um, for these frontline workers than in other um, settings of care. And here's another quote from one of our direct care worker story participants, um, a home care worker in Los Angeles that exemplifies what a difficult time this was. She says, Mary Shu says, when we got the stay at home order last March, I stopped working because I was just so, I'm just so scared of the virus. I feel emotionally and mentally drained. I started working again in August because I was a few months behind in paying my rent and I was so worried about getting evicted. Right now I'm just working once a week. I would like to work more, but it feels too risky. This quote really shows, I think, the balance of financial and family and safety concerns that these workers were managing uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And here's how the impact on the workforce in turn, specifically on DSPs in this, um, on this slide, impacted the delivery of services. Um, so this, the data that I'm about to show are from a 2022 report from Encore called the State of America's Direct Support Workforce Crisis. Um, and it shows the findings from community-based intellectual and developmental disability service providers um, uh, who responded to a survey that was fielded last August. Uh, so respondents, 83% of respondents to the survey reported that they are turning away new referrals due to a staffing shortage. 63% reported discontinuing programs and services altogether because of workforce pressures. Fully 92% reported that they're struggling to achieve quality standards like minimum staffing ratios. And 66% expressed concern that vacancy and turnover rates will worsen after the end of the public health emergency. So we're not looking at an end in sight in terms of the workforce crisis. And all of this, all of this has dire implications for the individuals and families who rely on these services. Uh, so where do we go from here? In my last five minutes or so, I would like to talk a little bit about how we recover from the devastation of COVID-19 and build a stronger, more stable direct support workforce going forward. So I'll share a couple of policy highlights and then briefly talk through a framework for improving job quality from the ground up. And as I'm, as I'm going through these next few slides, I encourage all of you to be thinking about where your role fits in here as an advocate, as an employer or supervisor, as a proximal member of the care team, another healthcare provider, as an individual or family member receiving services. There are ways for all of us to be champions in combating this long-standing but ever more acute workforce crisis. So one major policy highlight is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which among many other provisions, temporarily increased the federal match for states Medicaid home and community-based services. Every state had the opportunity to apply for this additional match on the proviso that they submitted a spending plan and showed how they would invest the money in expanding, enhancing, or strengthening their HCBS programs, not supplanting existing funds. Almost every state included significant workforce investments in their HCBS spending plans. Um, and those spending plans are good through 2025. So California, as is pictured here on the slide, uh, California's spending plan includes nearly $300 million for an IHSS career pathways program for direct care providers, uh, $150 million for a non-IHSS direct care training and stipend program, nearly $300 million for one-time bonuses and other provisions as well. This is short-term funding, so of course it's not a panacea, but it's a really important and exciting opportunity to build out some of the infrastructure that's needed to recruit and retain qualified direct care workers, including DSPs, um, as well as modestly recognizing their service during the pandemic. 
Um, there are also other exciting developments at the state level that many of you probably know better than I, but just really quickly to flag a couple of other federal bills, really just to show that there is momentum at the federal level to, to really try to tackle some of this, um, these workforce challenges. Uh, so first of all, there was the reintroduction last month of the Better Care, Better Jobs Plan. Uh, this, this legislation would permanently increase the federal match for Medicaid HCBS, putting more money into those programs while also requiring states to be proactive and accountable in developing plans to strengthen access to services, to, to address disparities in access, and explicitly to improve wages, benefits, and training standards for the workforce. Another piece of legislation that was introduced in 2021 uh, was the Direct Care Opportunity Act. This legislation would drive a $1 billion investment in interventions to improve training, recruitment, and retention in the direct care workforce through a range of demonstration projects. There has not been a lot of recent action on this bill, but um, it's out there and maybe reinvigorated at some point. One other piece of legislation to highlight is the Recognizing the Role of Direct Support Professionals Act of 2021. This is pro pr uh, proposed law to revise the Bureau of Labor Statistics occupational classification system to include direct support professionals as a distinct occupation. Um, sort of referring back to what I said earlier, this would be a really important opportunity to be able to better measure, monitor, and invest in the DSP workforce, which we know is a unique segment of the workforce. Uh, and to learn more about federal and state level workforce uh, related policy opportunities, I invite you to visit our website um, and check out some of our publications there, including our federal policy priorities report and state policy strategies report. And then finally, if it's okay for me to take two more minutes, I will just end by briefly talking through how we can build job quality from the ground up in practice, as well as through the policy changes that are needed. So here on the screen is PHI's five pillars of direct care job quality framework. And what this framework is designed to show is that job quality is multifaceted and there are many ways to improve job quality because that's what we need to do ultimately is to attract strong candidates to the field and keep them in their jobs and ensure their success in providing high quality care. So according to this, um, the five pillars framework, compensation, fair compensation absolutely matters as we know, but so too does quality training, quality supervision and support, respect and recognition, and real opportunity, meaning opportunity to continue to learn and grow and develop in the career, to develop a career path in direct support services. Um, this uh, five pillars framework is also available on our website uh, with much more information about each what each of these pillars can entail. Um, and I gave a definition of each of them in turn in the slide deck, but I won't talk through these now in the interests of time. Um, but I wanted to end just by uh, also uh, inviting you to check out this report, Caring for the Future. This was our flagship uh, report on the direct care workforce and policy and practice opportunities. And it really lays out the five pillars framework, um, as well as a range of recommendations in a lot of detail. There's our website, uh, phinational.org, and we have a whole host of resources and opportunities to learn more and engage there. And the final slide just provides my contact details. Um, and I thank you very much for your time and attention.